Hi guys, I hope all of you can hear me. Um, in case there's any problems through our video or through the audio, so let us know in the comments uh, at any point of time. Uh, so thanks a lot for the introduction, Komal. Uh, I'm Navya Agarwal. I run a furniture design studio uh, based out of New Delhi. Uh, we are called Studio Wood and I run it with two of my partners, Rinda and Sahaj. Uh, we've been practicing design since 2014. Uh, that was, we were just a year out of um, college when we all got together and started doing what we do now. So I'm going to do a screen share and talk you through the process. Uh, whatever questions you have, we can keep those towards the end. And uh, yeah, awesome. Let me just do a screen share. Okay. Awesome guys, the studio would say is hi to all of you. Uh, what we do is we make furniture. Uh, till date we've done six collections. Hi. <laughs> so till date we've done six collections. Uh, the first was Relove and it had like a whole very different theme and the way we actually even imagined that collection was very different from what we've done later. I would be talking about that specific collection in a few more slides later on. Um, We've exhibited our furniture across a lot of platforms uh, nationally and internationally like India Design ID, uh, Raw Collaborative, The Art Fair in Delhi and then uh, we also participated and were shortlisted for the Salone Satellite in Milan and we were also supposed to do the Wanted Design New York uh, this year which did get postponed indefinitely and uh, yeah and we also sell furniture through our website. So a little glimpse of what we have done over the, uh, over the years. Uh, this was our third collection 3.0 and these are a few glimpses of that. Uh, this was our fourth collection by the name of Figments uh, where we introduced uh, you know, a very traditional craft in a very modern structure aesthetic. Uh, so we did like lots of cane weaving with uh, sleek metal sections and lots of walnut wood. Um, and this was something that we did for the Kochi Biennale uh, in 2018, uh, where we again used a local craft and came up with site-specific furniture, which was all done through, uh, you know, like local, uh, by, which was all made by local craftsmen, but imagined by us. So let's start with the masterclass. Uh, I think the most important thing to crack is a brief. Uh, this stands true for any design uh, you know, thinking, uh, your brief needs to answer whom you're making things for, what the thing is going to be, when is it going to be used, where is it going to be used, and why does it, does it even need to exist? Um, so when we go deeper into it, uh, the who answers a lot more demographics. Uh, so things like, you know, uh, what age the person is going to be. Is it going to be a child? Is it going to be someone older? What occupation do they have? Is it something that is going to be used in the kitchen? Is it going to be a seating in a restaurant? Is it going to be seating at home? The physical build. Uh, so when we talk about the physical build, it becomes so important and vital uh, simply because a man's body probably differs from a woman's body. Uh, you know, maybe your torso is longer, maybe your legs are longer, maybe your arms are longer. So all those kind of physical aspects also become important. I think ability, whether it is differently able people or, you know, just uh, even when we look at different ethnicities, the ability of people changes and it's important to factor that in. Income also becomes very important because whom are you making things for? Are you making them for the masses? Are you making it for a niche audience? Uh, are you making a product that needs to be in every home because it's a requirement? Or are you making a very accented piece that needs to probably, you know, find five homes throughout the world? And uh, the last being social behavior. Again, social behavior stems from the fact that in, uh, you know, how do we perceive our culture? How do we perceive the people around us? and how they are going to perceive the objects that we interact with every day. Uh, for example, if we take about uh, just on the top of my head, like if you think about like a black chair at a wedding, you usually would not find that in India because black is not a very auspicious color uh, when we talk about specific cultures within India. So all those kind of social behaviors also matter a lot. Next being what? So what answers the function of the product? and the product range. 
Uh, usually I divide the whole product range into three, uh, seating, uh, storage and table surfaces. So mostly everything can fit into this. And then there are obviously like a lot more furniture pieces, like a coat hanger, which you can partially say can be fitted into like storage of a, a, you know, of a coat or a hat or an umbrella. So the function and the product range, they go hand in hand. So it's important to answer what you are solving. Um, having said that broadly, you can categorize every piece of furniture into these three. I don't think it's only limited to these three. There are times when you also combine and cross, uh, you know, cross boundaries and let one piece of furniture serve several functions and also be a part of several kind of product ranges. The when and the where. Uh, I think place, season, time of what activities you're doing, they also account for a lot about how a furniture piece needs to be made or thought of. Uh, the place becomes important in terms of, you know, what season it would be, uh, you know, is it a place that gets really cold? So I wouldn't want to give someone a metal seat to sit on because otherwise they're going to really freeze. Uh, so even thoughts about what kind of surroundings are there, you know, what time of the day is it something that you're going to be using early in the morning or late in the night? How does the day differ from the night? All those aspects uh, also become part of the brief. And then the why, which is usually how you always start. It's about you identify a problem and you solve a problem. And that identification of a problem does not have to be all the factors. It can be one factor. Maybe you think that, okay, there is, uh, you know, there's very limited options of a console in a way for a low income group. Even identifying a problem like that and then creating a design which is like low on cost, uh, can fit into multiple types of homes that becomes the problem solving. So the why becomes the key to everything that you design. So like I mentioned, uh, the first exhibition that we ever did, it was called the Dilaf Collection. Uh, this is a graphic from it and this is kind of what we did. So the brief, uh, the key highlights of our brief rather, uh, came from the fact that first uh, we had lots of discarded samples lying at an old workshop. Uh, that was the first opportunity that we saw. Second was that uh, the collective, there were four of us back then, we all had mixed expertise. We had a graphic designer, we had an architect, we had a lighting designer and a furniture designer imagining pieces of furniture. Uh, the fourth part, which was very important, was the fact that we were all bootstrapping. Uh, like I mentioned, we were all young and fresh out of college. So we were very, very tight on the budget. And how do you release a whole furniture collection without even spending money? Uh, the next thing that we knew that our client is someone who's young at heart. It's someone who's going to be open to ideas, uh, open to something fresh, which is not very typically found. And uh, which also means that they're probably new homeowners or, you know, they have their own room, which they are renovating. And the last thing that happened to be by default was the fact that all of us were in Delhi and therefore the collection was made, keeping in mind Delhi. So this is exactly what we did. Um, the first collection that we ever made, sorry, yeah. So the first collection that we ever made, uh, we took old pieces of furniture that were already lying in the factory as discarded samples and we gave them a new function. Uh, so for example, uh, if what you see on your screen right now, this used to be an old shelf. So instead of having it vertically up, we put it horizontally down, we added little leg structures and then we added a glass top and made it into a table. Another example, yeah, and uh, what you see on your far right, the red image, that's exactly how the table ended up looking. So we added like those little wooden members that you see on the floor and then we added a glass top. Another example was there were so many old, uh, you know, side tables. So we took out all the drawers from that. We added these little uh, lathe wooden legs. Uh, again, gave it a nice foamy top. And again, we also added knobs to retain the identity of a drawer. And that's how we came up with this specific design. So these are images from, uh, you know, the first collection that we did, in which our brief was very different from what our brief became then on. Uh, in this collection, like you uh, see, everything was using old discarded samples, uh, which became uh, key. 
I think the next very important aspect of furniture design is the materials that we use, uh, all because they kind of define the look of. Um, sorry, because they define the whole look of the product. They also add so much functionality. Is the material soft? Is it hard? Is it durable? Is it malleable? Uh, you know, can it sustain the outdoors? Can it sustain all weathers, or is it only friendly for the indoors? Uh, is it something that has longevity? Uh, is it going to remain new for the next fifty years, or is it something that's going to age very beautifully but very soon? Um, you know, is there transparency in the material? Uh, can can I do layering with the material? So I think understanding what kinds of material exist. and uh, becomes a very important part of the process and uh, more often than not it's important to remember or uh, you know decide what materials are going to be using kind of from the beginning based on the previous brief that we just discussed uh, so for example like i said like i wouldn't want to use metal in an outdoor furniture piece uh, which gets very cold or very hot uh, for that matter um at the same time like you know something like using a uh, concrete for the outdoors would work beautifully uh because i know that it can sustain a lot more different weather seas and seasons uh you know something like cane uh which uh, ages actually very beautifully and it ages very slowly so again that's something that i would love to use for a person who's you looking for a piece of furniture with longevity so materials becomes an important part and uh, therefore before designing any collection uh, of pieces of furniture it's important that you kind of bring together exactly what you want uh, you know even when we talk about woods uh, despite of the different kind of properties every wood has its own grain is that grain something that you would resonate with uh, you know if if i talk about a birch which has so much more grain in it uh, you know compared to something a lot more flatter uh i would want to use birch for someone who's younger who likes more pattern instead of someone who prefers like you know more subdued grains uh the most important part i would say of furniture design after obviously creating the brief is form generation and uh form generation uh we studied back in college that you can literally get inspired by anything uh we often used a lot more materials or forms that we saw in nature uh you know whether it was like you know leaf patterns or shells or even you know how the clouds are um specifically for us we have taken a lot more inspiration from architecture given the fact that we all had a mixed expertise within the group uh so for example what you see here uh this is a bridge and we kind of use the similar form for the back of the seat uh so you know the top is more flatter the base goes uh you know it goes in a more concave i think concave is the word it goes in a more concave manner and then it's collect connected by vertical bars so um and the second part of form generation which i think becomes important is that after you make a design you study it further you study the ergonomics of the chair how it uh, you know works so the first chair that we made for example we realized that there were problems with the fact that we were not being able to make it uh, you know more friendly for the back uh, because you know those bars kind of dug into your body so we decided okay we need to add a plank of wood uh, or you know any any more sturdy backrest so then we redefined uh you know the shape of this particular piece and then we came up with the reconnect which is now you can see here how the first uh design transformed to the second and a lot went into the form generation of this uh i think when we talk about uh furniture design uh i don't think as designers our work needs to stop at the design stage uh communication of design probably is as important as the form generation and just ideating the final design um and uh, usually it always starts with the sketch i personally love working on grid notebooks because you understand proportions better so whether it's grid in terms of checkered or it's just dots it's easier to understand it's easier to you know uh have more and better proportions uh while you're designing a piece of furniture so everything always starts with a sketch uh the second thing that we usually work on is autocad uh in order to understand uh that everything that's been drawn how does it translate so 
I always start with line drawings just to kind of put all my thoughts together. Uh, then kind of converted into like thicknesses, thickness of you know the board that you're using or the wood that you're using. Um, that becomes the second part of it. The third part that you see here is a uh, is a view that we create completely on SketchUp, where each and every element, each and every joinery is planned together. And then we do something that we call an exploded view, where all the different components which which will be manufactured by different vendors are kind of uh, you know showcased in a more uh, deconstructed manner just so you know that okay you know this is going to be made in one part this is going to be made in the second part and then that's how it's all going to come together so the central image that you see uh, right on the bottom is how it all looks together what goes above that you have the cabinetry happening you have the uh, you know the the palla opening separately you have the whole leg structure then you have like a metal frame and then how the planter is also built. So there's like even an exploded drawing for the planter that we see, uh, which is like two wooden rings, you know, put together with a metal frame and then a glass bottle that just slides in. So this process is very important. Um, usually if you just, you know, have the final 3D with you, there are a lot of things that you might skip, but the moment you do an exploded view, you actually understand how it's going to be constructed. Um, and this is what the piece finally looks like. So I think uh, our 3D to the actual execution went pretty well. So uh, an important part of the whole design process, again, like I said, if you're, especially if you're selling uh, your pieces, it doesn't stop at getting the final design in hand. Uh, a very important aspect is how you're going to ship it, how it's going to reach the client. Would it need assembly? Uh, you know, tomorrow if the client wants to move out of uh, the existing space, so how do they actually manage that huge product? So this particular piece that you see, it's a large four by four coffee table. Um, and, uh, you know, when we were constructing it, uh, we realized that, okay, the, you know, the base, it's like a huge, it's a thick metal sheet. It becomes very heavy to move it from one place to another. So this is how we designed it. Everything is in different parts. And uh, because we supply Pan India, it was very important for us to even understand that we will not be able to send an assembly team to every single uh, you know, uh, buyer. So it means that the buyer should be able to assemble it themselves, uh, ideally without tools or with very, very basic tools like a hammer or a screwdriver, whatever is available to most people at home. So, uh, you know, the kind of details that you do. So for this, we had like a very simple uh, slide joint, uh, not even a joint, it was just like a slide mechanism where you slide the C, the metal C shape into, you know, these two wooden um, circular discs. Uh, even the ta main table that you see, uh, it had like a little, um, it had like a box detail, which just fits into the metal triangles at the bottom and when you put the whole piece together that's what you see uh, so I think prototyping uh, is another key um, part in the process a lot of things that are designed on paper uh, when you actually come to executing them uh, they fail um, not because you did something wrong on paper on paper most of it always works but there are different aspects to why things fail when you're actually constructing them so uh, this particular piece, it all uh, you know, looked fine. Even when we did the exploded view, it was all coming together. But what we didn't realize was that uh, the cost, sorry, yeah, that uh, the cost of actually bending the metal sheet would become so high for us that it would become an unsaleable product. Uh, so uh, because of that, we actually eventually ended up doing just a, simple uh, flat metal sheet instead of actually bending it. So prototyping comes from a lot more experience. That's where you understand, okay, you know, what are the things that are not working uh, in an on-ground reality scenario? Um, I think uh, for me personally, uh, how easily you can adapt a design uh, shows that it's good design. Uh, because again, it saves on multiple factors, like, you know, such as, uh, you know, prototyping, I can prototype one part of it, and then I know that I can adapt it to uh, many, many more designs. So example, this design, uh, you know, you on the left, what you see is just a regular chair, but on the right, it's a bar stool. So we just added some height, uh, gave it like a little more uh, leg support, and uh, we had it. 
and then again you know with the new uh, reconnect chair that we did as a second version of this uh, you know the fact that i can do so many different finishes i can do fabric or i can do solid wood uh, you know i can do a round back i can do a square back i can do a rectangular back there's so much variation that you can play around with uh, which i would suggest like helps uh, you know me just make one metal frame and then kind of replicate it and share that as multiple designs so i think if you're looking at uh, furniture design from a uh, you know retailer perspective or from a sales perspective it's important to understand how you can actually uh, increase the or benefit yourself maximum with just making you know one simple good frame um i think a very important part of what we talk about today is sustainability um and uh, fairly so but i would also like to give my two cents on what i feel sustainability is so while uh, we all identify sustainability as you know the kind of materials we're using or the kind of resources we are using which is very important there are other aspects to sustainability um you know how good your process is uh, you know is it uh, eating up too much time how much effort is required what is the maintenance of that piece after it's gone into someone's home and what's the longevity of design um the reason why i feel that you know time and effort is often not considered as a part of sustainability i do not understand why um but the fact that if someone has spent you know 6 hours in making a piece which should have ideally been you know whereas it should only take 2 hours it means that you're wasting a resource and the resource doesn't have to be very tangible it doesn't have to be that oh you know what i've used this much less wood it's also the fact that number of man hours that have gone into it and you know probably the electricity that that man used extra just to you know create that piece um these kind of aspects should be considered when you're talking about how sustainable a piece is um again when i talk about uh, you know the first collection that we did which was rila which was out of old discarded samples it was very sustainable to a point where things that would have otherwise gone for zero or no value or very little value uh they suddenly had a lot more to add to someone's house uh so a chair which was discarded which would have been sold to you know a raddi guy for 500 bucks suddenly could be sold for 5000 bucks because a little more design intervention was done so that is also part of sustainability how an old sample which is lying for 10 years is found in a new home and can be you know used for another 20 years so that gets me to the brief of the competition um so i'll just read this out and uh, the objective of the competition is to develop an innovative and interactive multi utility shelving system that would be suitable for the new work from home situation uh, with a maximum size of 4 feet by 6 feet by 2 feet uh, this may be a wall mounted fixture a free standing or a suspended fitting and uh, the competition invites designers to create a dynamic furniture that is both utilitarian and aesthetic in nature serving people of a targeted age group and segment um which uh, mainly means that you would be creating your own brief uh with you know whom you are making it for what you are making and how you are making when and where what location would it be used at so uh, that whole brief is something that you would be creating yourself and uh, then the shelving systems can be a link uh, between uh, functionality and form uh, encapsulating the multifaceted usage of one uh, right from storage of books or stationery making the shelf a plant propagation station uh, you know hanging your headphones keys or charger a dock for your speaker and many additional uses of a shelf this piece of furniture has a lot of scope for exploration effective and quality furniture can be explored for modularity uh, when it comes to space saving or building a custom shelf as per your evolving requirements uh, and these would be a key criteria in judging the competition uh, so the reason why i've specifically mentioned like you know custom shelves for your evolving requirements it means that you know during the day you might want your shelf to have one purpose and by night you might need it for something else or you know right now you are using the shelf in a certain way and tomorrow if you go back to whichever city maybe your parents or your siblings can use it for their requirements so that's the kind of evolving requirements we're talking about and uh, additional factors such as material experimentation uh the manufacturing processes and the longevity of design directly impact the sustainability of a, 
uh, of a product which are given in today's uh, day and age. So these would also be of key uh, you know, criteria when we are done the competition. Uh, when we talk about the process of making, I think the first thing for you to, would be to understand where the problem lies. So when we talk about shelving units nowadays, uh, what do you think is lacking in what's already existing? Uh, from there, you can easily come up with a brief. You can understand that, okay, is it that uh, we don't have shelving uh, units for older people or, you know, the kind of shelving units we have, uh, you know, they all give like a very standard shelving height. So is, it that, is that something like that, that I can play with? So creating a brief out of whatever problem you have identified would be very important. Uh, the next step would be to understand what materials you're going to be using, which again would be derived from the brief itself. Uh, concept and inspiration uh, is completely open about what you want to be inspired by, whether, you know, it's, uh, it's just a requirement, uh, you know, very, very specific to the function, or is it something that is derived from the nature? Is it something that's derived from a piece of architecture that's existing? Is it derived from, you know, the way you, uh, you know, just view different objects? Maybe it's an artwork that inspires you. And that activity is going to help you with the form generation. Um, form generation should not be usually limited to, you know, you know, five or six ways of uh, imagining a piece. I think with form generation, you should always go all out, see every aspect, uh, imagine the form from a plan view or imagine the form from an orthographic or a you know, front elevational view. So there's a lot more exploration that can be done. Uh, think of the form volumetrically, think of the form in 2D, think of the form that you know, if I slice up my inspiration into half, how would it look? So there are different ways of doing form generation. Uh, design feasibility, obviously that becomes the most important that whether the form that you're looking at and the problem you had identified, do they actually help each other? Uh, so design feasibility is obviously the most important. Um, and uh, along with design feasibility, it also comes like, you know, can you even manufacture this piece? Uh, is it that you're using 10 different materials which are not available in the same country also? So means you are scouting for materials from different places. So that come, all that comes under design feasibility. Iterations and variations of the same design. Uh, you know, try the same thing with a little more rounded surfaces, a little more sharp surfaces, a little more height, a little, you know, stout looking uh, piece or something that's very, very lengthy. And after all those iterations, I'm sure that you'll all come up with a great final design. So the criteria of the judgment uh, are going to uh, be based on the concept, the material explorations, the design feasibility, uh, the environmental assessment, which is very important about what all factors you have taken care of from the environment, both from a sustainability point of view and from a functional point of view. Uh, then the social and cultural assessment, uh, whom you've designed for, does it fit into their, uh, you know, every day? Does it fit into their cultural, uh, you know, scenarios? Um, so that becomes important. Innovation or technology, is, that some, is there something new that you've used? Uh, you know, you all have these very cool uh, tabletops on which you can just put your phone and charge without even adding a wire. So do you want to, you know, add one of that? Do you want to add some innovative hardware that, you know, you had read about? Uh, all that would come under innovation or technology. And then obviously the final design. So I think with that, uh, this is what I have. Um, any questions that anyone may have? Um, okay, guys. Give me a second. Uh, so there's a question. Uh, yeah. What are the problems faced by the left-hand users in using facilities and devices? Okay, so uh, my brother's a left-handed um, person, um, and uh, so it you know it entirely actually depends. Um, with furniture, I haven't noticed so much because furniture is usually very symmetric. But with products, I have seen so much, like something as small as the scissors, uh, because, you know, your thumb area actually inverts completely, uh, you know, something like a mouse, uh, which has settings, by the way, that you can, you know, configure the mouse for a left-handed person, but even something like that. So those kind of problems do come up, um, uh, you know, to think about, like, you also have these uh, chases and these loungers, which 
on one side have rest and the other side they don't so you know small things like you can't keep your cup of coffee on if you're left handed you don't want to keep your cup of coffee on the right so things like those also do come up so i think that's a beautiful uh, problem that you have identified and i think it has like a lot more scope uh, to be explored yeah i hope i've answered your question there's another question yeah. uh this type of furniture is quite common these days but what are uh, but what made you stand out from the and become popular uh okay i don't think i'm popular or <laughs> popular by the way guys uh i don't think personally we've ever strive for what you're popular i mean i I, we've done work for seven years, and I hope the work six years, and I hope the work speaks for itself. But uh, I think what's always stood out, uh, very honestly, from the first collection, uh, the fact that we didn't take a very, very uh, you know conventional route of just designing good furniture. Um, our first thing was that okay. what are the resources that you have so i think the brief that we built for the first collection was very interesting it did help us grab a lot more eyeballs because firstly since we were reloving furniture we could sell good looking furniture for very cheap uh, you know i could sell a chair for 5000 whereas today even the manufacturing cost wouldn't come anywhere close to that so uh, that became important uh, i think uh, after that like you know we did do like two collections which were you know full out there then i think we also uh look back a little and then thought that okay what is it that our country has to offer so we did a collection with craft caning but at the same time the same collection was uh, you know also showcased in milan so we knew that whatever designs we make have to be cosmopolitan um so i think just that mix and match of you know identifying what is it that your resources are there and versus what you want to put out there just kind of bridging the gap has uh, helped us uh you know gain a lot more popularity in today's day and age yeah there's one more question that uh, how important the joinery plays in the role of furniture so uh, joinery is uh, very important uh, obviously because uh, a, a bad joint is surely going to loosen up maybe in a day maybe in a year or maybe in 10 years but good joinery uh, you know helps sustain the strength of a product uh there's a lot to be played with joinery unfortunately we haven't done too much but there are there's so much in nailless joinery uh which means that if you're just you know putting and cutting your sections correctly uh putting it all together you don't even need a single screw going in uh it means that everything is 100% woodwork and nothing else uh there's a lot you can study about joinery uh the kinds of joinery that are there uh there's a book called woodworking and joinery that you can check out i know may be available on amazon um and uh, which just simply talks about you know like how boards are made also where joinery becomes important is uh when you're talking about like you know making large pieces uh so without giving you know extra framework can you just like join two planks just using uh, you know maybe a dovetail or something else um so all those aspects are covered in joinery i think it uh, when you're specifically talking about woodworking joinery is uh, is one of the key elements to that to the design thinking there the next question is uh, okay so uh, navya can you just name a few softwares which uh, they can use because a lot of people are asking that can i use this software yeah okay. yeah so i think uh, uh, the key softwares that i use like i mentioned like autocad is something that we use for all our drawings uh it's very popular i'm sure there are other alternates but it also helps in uh, you know communicating with an architect because i can always send them a file of cad because everyone's working on cad uh so for all your technical detailing uh because you can even like you know show a 1 mm uh you know uh, thickness on cad uh which is very easily viewable um for our 3d's we usually use sketchup uh again the reason being because it's it's very easy it's like something that i picked up without even studying it in college i mean i personally think it's as easy as paint used to be back in the 90s uh just play around with it i'm sure you'll figure out how to use it uh people also use uh you know um rhino for their 3d 
cookies. Uh, that's not something that I've personally used, but I'm sure it's a very popular software. Uh, for your uh, rendering requirements, uh, you know, there is uh, V-Ray, which is again very popular. It's supported by 3ds Max. 3, 3ds Max is in fact another 3D software uh, for creating uh, products and spaces. Um, so yeah, so I was saying that uh, V-Ray is very popular for rendering. Revit is very popular for rendering. Uh, there's always a little bit of Photoshop that you can do. Uh, to either stylize or to make your uh, renders even more realistic. So I think uh, those are all the, yeah, I think those are all the softwares that I use. Okay. Yeah. So there's another question. How do you start and set up your workshop for getting products made? Okay. Uh, so I think uh, a very... Um, I mean, in our experience, what's happened is that we have used tons of materials through all of our different collections. Uh, the only things that we have within our workshop is a woodworking, uh, you know, setup uh, with uh, very basic hand tools and machinery. Uh, for everything else, we have multiple vendors. So we, we have like metal vendors, we have resin vendors, uh, we have cane vendors. So I think first thing is that you don't have to have everything within your workshop. It's okay to build an ecosystem of different people uh, whom you can collaborate with. Um, now within your workshop, I think the first thing to have is some very, very basic uh, hand tools. Uh, you know, uh, I can share a list of probably all the hand tools that would be required. You need a bench press, uh, you need like a saw, you will need, uh, you know, all those bits. Um, another thing to understand is that how would you be finishing it? Are you just going to be doing, you know, a simple polish on it or is it that you're going to be doing a PU? So again, all those um, finishes also, would you want to have all those uh, well, uh, facilities within your workshop or is it something that you would want to, you know, outsource again? So it's okay to have like multiple, uh, yeah, like multiple vendors to support that ecosystem. Yeah. There's a question of a fresh graduate and uh, they want to know that how do I sell my designs and how do I attract customers and get publicity? Okay, so two, three things. Firstly, um, like we all have equal access to social media. Uh, you know, back in the day it was Facebook when we started off, but today it's mostly all Instagram. It's very easy to just put your work out there, um, you know, just to share it. And I think what I've realized over time, which is more of a social media class than a furniture class, but is the fact that you have to involve people in the process. Uh, just the final look of how your piece turns out is not the key uh, because people do resonate a lot with the maker, with the process of making than just with the final product. Uh, second thing is that, uh, honestly, all your magazines uh, are looking out for content. So just write them an email, I think on the first, or the, not the first, but I think on the second or the fourth page of every magazine, you have a list of uh, all the editors and you can just email them. It's not very hard. So if there is something that you have, which you feel should be shared, uh, just, just go ahead and email. And I'm sure after at least five emails, they will surely reply to something. Great. So I think Navya is even teaching us marketing. <laughs> I, I know I sort of for the question, but that's fine. That that's what I've done in the past few years. Right. So, nowadays there are many unusual shape furniture trends coming up. Yeah. What is your opinion on the on it and uh, in future? How is it uh, you know futuristic for India? So I personally love experimenting with things. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm all for uh, just playing with the randomest shapes. Uh, it's not the most easily buyable or saleable product uh, because uh, usually the way our architecture is also built, it's built on four walls to every room. Uh, so because of that, we prefer straight line furniture because it just gets pushed to a wall. However, I'm sure there's a niche of people who really enjoy, you know, having such things. In fact, uh, my coffee table is a very, very irregular, random shape. Um, so there are, you know, elements 
which work like for example a coffee table of an irregular sh shape can work but a chair of an irregular shape may or may not work so that's the first thing to think about uh, second is uh, when you actually step out to much larger scale projects where you know you have like uh, you know 5000 square feet 15000 square feet and upwards uh, you can play a lot with, more with irregular shapes because uh, they don't have to be pushed to a wall they can be a central piece uh, but i always feel that most irregular shaped products uh, are always going to be an accent furniture and may not be something that goes throughout the house because it's going to be very difficult to tie the different pieces of furniture together but do do go ahead and experiment there should be no reason to not to do that right okay so designing a furniture sometimes is, uh, you know as a interior student is difficult only one furniture design uh, on skin only one furniture is designed for a project specifically how do you know where i should go and what resources should i um i don't know what is it i think uh, they need to specify it more clearly um okay there's another question do you face fear of your designs being stolen by the manufacturer and what measures should be taken okay so uh, it has happened to us um so I mean, there, there are honestly there are two very different schools of thought. It depends on your mood, what you're feeling that day when you find out that something like this has happened. Uh, there are some days you just brush it down, thinking that you know uh, you're above it, and uh, only because it's good is it being manufactured. Uh, there are some days where you feel really horrible because you've put in so much of the effort, and uh, you know for someone else it's just like they've manufactured it once and now they're going to sell it like pancakes. so um it's uh, the only way to safeguard it is through uh, like legally through uh, you know patenting your pieces or having a copyright on your pieces uh, it is a process that takes both time and money uh, so you have to be you know you have to kind of weigh your pros and cons about getting into such a system uh, again it's not necessary that all your pieces need to be copyright or all your pieces need to be patented so if you feel that okay you know there's one specific piece that is uh, you know very very unique uh, in every aspect then you should 100% apply for a copyright and uh, other than that and this is something that's genuinely happened there's so much design out there uh, sometimes it's also a genuine mistake that you know people do something very similar so uh, i mean i strongly some believe in the philosophy of just forgive and move on and uh, that's something that i am by by but uh, it to each one its own yeah can generalize it yeah. but yeah you can copyright it how important uh, how important roles do you think that a carpenter or any maker has for the final outcome of a furniture uh the most uh, probably like uh, i may be replaceable but sometimes i feel that not uh because of that i am also very very specific about which carrier is actually making my piece in the factory so we usually like you know when we are making a collection of suppose 10 pieces we usually just like you know out of the whole team of you know seven eight carpenters we usually pick two so there's always a master craftsman whose skill is good um they understand a lot more details uh, you know about uh, the material about the joineries about the finishing uh, they also sometimes foresee problems so exactly like you know when you're prototyping it's so important that you do it in coordination with uh them because you know every single day when you're sitting with them they'll tell you something new uh, they'll come up with problems that you couldn't even imagine and it just helps you refine your design even more so i think a good team of people to execute uh, especially uh, you know the first few times you're making it because you would be refining your process the first few times you're making it yourself uh, it's important to have a uh, you know good craft person associated with the product so i think uh, four more questions not <laughs> okay so which type of materials and furniture are most durable according to you oh uh, which material and and what and furniture which materials and furniture according to you are most durable mm. i mean uh, i am very very partial towards wood uh to start with uh because uh, 
I think it it's a very beautiful material. It has so much character. Uh, you know, even if you're picking the same teak or wall art, uh, every single time you're gonna get a new batch. The knots are going to be different. Uh, you know the uh you no know, everything the grains are going to be different there's always going to be slight color variation and i love the fact that not every wooden piece of furniture will look like it'll never look like unless you literally just paint over it so i find wood uh, a very classic material uh in terms of durability of materials i think um i think concrete uh especially like you know there's so much more innovation in concrete there's foam concrete which is a very lightweight concrete it can be cast very easily which means that you can play with a lot more shapes uh it's very good for the outdoors and for the indoors um and uh, again like you know you can match it with a wood or metal so i think i would say concrete is probably a interesting material to experiment with in the future and wood is always going to be a class So someone is asking, is wood or resin sustainable? Uh, so um, uh, it depends where you are procuring wood from. Uh, very specifically, uh, there are uh, you know specific organizations which work with either reclaimed wood or wood of trees that have fallen naturally. uh and and now obviously like then there are a lot more sellers of wood who probably are into deforestation so it depends entirely from where you are procuring your wood uh there's no very generic answer when you come to sustainability of wood it is a material that has longevity of time uh like i said like you know it can go up for more than 100 years very easily so there's no issue from a time perspective that's going to get wasted you can also reuse wood uh, you know you can always break down the frame of a chair and then use like smaller logs of wood to uh, a smaller planks or smaller sections of wood to recreate a different piece of furniture which we've done in the past so wood in that sense yes um resin uh, again there are different kinds of resin uh, resin epoxy is not so much i wouldn't call it a sustainable material uh, yeah resin overall i wouldn't call it a very sustainable material. how often should we go uh, keep going back to original designs for making the better or uh, better alterations and working yeah i think you can just that's fine like if it's your original design you can explore it tons and tons of ways uh, if you look at some of the very very iconic pieces even the pierre generate chair it's one very simple design which has been iterated into like seven or eight versions today and uh, that's completely okay i mean you want to make 100 versions of it and sell it that's completely fine so i think a good design is something that can have a million versions and still be sold as uh, you know a million different products so it's it's the best you will not have to ever make a second design if you can just give them that uh one more person has uh do we have to make shelves thinking of home interiors means more feasible or um we can make shelves thinking of lounges hotels uh so uh, as a part of our, yeah so as a part of our brief we very specifically mentioned our work from home uh you know piece of furniture so that's something that supports your new everyday which would probably be within your home so i think uh, for this contest we're going to for the competition we are going to limit it to uh, residential great i think a lot of people asked a lot of questions which are related to our guidelines and uh, uh, which is we be sharing it to you by tomorrow so if you don't get it tomorrow please dm us or email it to me so i'll send it then to you all yeah and uh, thank you so much navya and it, i think it was an insightful talk and design the fan you know the way you explain things um so i hope uh, like you know people in the attendees i think there were like some lot of attendees who attended at least 200 of them <laughs> so i yeah. was on zoom and i didn't have to see so many people otherwise i would have got jitters <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah so um the competition uh start contest starts from tomorrow 
and you'll have to submit your designs by the 6th of September. And uh, after that, uh, the results will be out in 15 days. And now we will be uh, obviously, you know, checking your designs and then choose one winner. Mm -hmm. Great. So thank you so much, Navya. It's, it's uh, lovely to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope all of you learned one new thing, if not more today. One all second. Right. So those would like to join. Yes. Sorry, I, I this uh, webinar thing. Kumar refused to let me uh, be a host or say anything. <laughs> What's my way over here to say uh, thank you so much, Navya. And uh, I also learned a lot today. Especially the part about using concrete. I hope that uh, we can do something. <laughs> Absolutely, we're waiting for that. I think COVID just dampened those plans, but I think now that the lockdown is easing, we should also restart on that. Yeah, we must restart. Awesome. Thanks so much. Really informative and loved it. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone else. Thank you for spending your evening, your Friday evening with me. Yeah, where's the beer, man? It is. It is. It's actually uh, in the fridge right now. My husband just came and stocked up the fridge. Now that we're done with this hour for today. Awesome. Cool, man. Catch you later. See you. Thanks Bye. 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 Thank you.